I want to welcome those who are here. I want to welcome those who, of course, are watching online tonight and worshiping with your church family here together, even if it's virtually. Our family's been watching on Netflix, a show called Designated Survivor. I don't know if any of you have watched it, but we were trying to explain the show to our kids and, and kind of what it was about. And Karen just says, you know, in passing, she goes, well, it's kind of like a soap opera. And the kids had never heard that phrase, soap opera, before. They, they said, what's a soap opera? And Karen just answered off the cuff. She said, a really slow TV show where nothing happens. <laughs> I don't know why you would watch one of those TV shows, but I will admit as a child, I used to love to watch Days of Our Lives. Now that's, I know, it's, I don't know why. Like we would go to Little League practice and other kids watched it too. And we boys talked about Days of Our Bo and Hope and Marlena and John and Patch and Billy, Victor Kiriakis. We, we knew them all. And then I go to college. For some reason, I end up in a fraternity house where we watch Days of Our Lives on our lunch break. And we watch Days of Our Lives all through college. Nothing happens on this show ever I graduate college. Karen was a fan of the show, too. That might have been what brought us together. We, we get married. We move into our first apartment. We got the VHS recorder thing, one tape. I think we recorded over our wedding, recording days of our lives so that we could watch it when we got home. Soap operas are so slow moving. Nothing ever happens. So why do we watch this show? Is there something built within our DNA that wants slowness, that causes us to thrive in slowness. We're in week three of this new series called Refuge Basics, and I thought just as we were ramping up as a church, what better time to do a refresh of what our culture is as a church, and what better time for each of you listening out in virtual land and each of you here to make the decision if this is the church that you want to be committed to, that this is the church family that you want to be a part of. And so you've got eight weeks to kind of think about that and make that decision as we're relaunching and ramping things up. Now, this last week, I had a lot of time on my hands to lay out a full series. I hadn't had enough time to do that yet. And so in my head, I had like 30 different ideas that I thought described our culture. And I've been keeping notes on that pretty much all summer. And finally this week, I got to sit down and boil that 30 down to, I thought, eight things that encompassed all 30 of those items that I thought best described our cornerstones of our culture. And so week one, if you remembered, we talked about being a misfit church, that we're all sinners and we know it. Last week, we talked about being a small church, how we feel called to be purposely small. Next week, we're going to talk about being an organic church, which really fits with where we're at this week. And week five, we'll talk about being a restful church, which again, all these things kind of fit together. And then we'll go on to deep church, one church, and end on being a committed church. This week, though, as mentioned, we're talking about being a slow church. Now, I mentioned that to Karen this week. Again, we're out on the table outside, and we're talking about things. I said, I'm going to talk about being a slow church. She says, like, not very bright. I said... <laughs> No, there are a lot of definitions of being slow, and so we're not talking about a church that's not the sharpest tools in the shed, although that may apply to us, I don't know. But we're not talking about slow in that way. We're talking about slow in regard to speed, in regard to pace, or rhythm, slow rhythm. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, it's a famous verse, but it's message, I like the paraphrase translation, and this is Jesus speaking, and he says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Doesn't say run with me. He says walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. And then this beautiful line, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Week number one, we said that the gospel of grace, that is the core of this church that we want to model our culture after the culture of Jesus. And if we want to do that, then we ought to do what he says. We ought to learn the unforced rhythms of grace. This week, I, I racked my brain trying to think of the perfect Bible story that would illustrate this idea of being a slow church. Couldn't come up with a Bible story. A lot of verses came to mind, but I couldn't come up with that one story. Verses was like Proverbs 19.2. 
Enthusiasm without knowledge is no good. Haste makes mistakes. In other words, when you do things fast, you tend to make a lot of mistakes. We all know that uh, here very well. We were rushing right down to the wire trying to get sound ready and video ready, and so I'm sure there were mistakes because of our haste. But we don't want to be here at 9 this morning, so uh, we got here at 3 o'clock and did the best that we could. Proverbs 20, 25 says, An impulsive vow is a trap. Later, you'll wish you could get out of it. In other words, be careful when you make promises because uh, we need to learn how to say no. In Job chapter 9, this is Job speaking after he's gone through all this difficulty in his life. He says, my life passes more swiftly than a runner. It flees away without a glimpse of happiness. That's pretty dark. And as we age, if you've ever been in those dark places, you can kind of feel your life kind of slipping and running away as you're just there in the dark place. Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah the prophet speaking, he says to the people, when will you stop running? When will you stop panting after other gods? We still have other gods in this culture. We pant after technology and all these things that are fast. And it says we'll wear out. James chapter 1, probably one of the most famous ones. You must all be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry. That's very fitting for the world we find ourselves in today. 2 Peter chapter 3, this is Peter trying to encourage some impatient believers in the church. He says, well, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. Heard that one perhaps before. Anybody? I never do like cheesy jokes, but I'm going to do one tonight. Uh, I heard a long time ago, man says to an angel in reference to this verse, he says to the angel that he meets, he says, well, Mr. Angel, how, how long is a million years to you angels? And the angel replies, well, it's about a minute. A million years is like a minute to us. And so the man says, well, then how much is a million dollars to you angels? And the angel asks, well, a million dollars is worth about a penny to us angels. And so the man says, well, Mr. Angel, would you give me a penny? Angel responds, sure, in a minute. You guys were delayed on that. There's a little delay in the uptake, but <laughs> if, if I, I just couldn't think of that one perfect text that I wanted to use tonight. I was kind of in that same boat last week, and I'm driving around in the car this week, and it hit me. I'm like, oh, I should have used Gideon. I mean, we talked about small church last week, and you know how Gideon takes the 32,000 soldiers, and God shrinks them to 10, and the army's still too big, and shrinks the army down. They go to the water. They lap up the water like dogs. Those who do that get kicked out of the army, and it's, it's a small little army that's left. That would have been the perfect story last week. I didn't think of it. So I'm sure there is a perfect text that one of you will tell me about that I could have used for tonight when we consider this idea about being a slow church. But as most of my theology has been developed, and it probably should for everyone be developed this way, it's not developed by a single story in the Bible. It's not developed by a single verse in the Bible. My theology, and I think all of our theology, should come from the entire story of the Bible, from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to Revelation chapter 22. And when we read scripture, if you've ever read through it cover to cover, it reads much less like a fast two-hour movie and a lot more like the OG soap opera of God. Five seasons in that soap opera. Season one, it's the story of creation. And we only get a couple of chapters about God's creation in Genesis chapter one and chapter two, but in our modern time here, science has revealed that God's creation was incredibly slow billions upon billions of years for creation and it was incredibly detailed and we are only now learning beginning to learn the detail of God in that slow creation I mentioned last week about my love of national parks and the PBS series and the guy who kind of founded the national park movement his name is John Muir if you haven't heard of him and and, uh, one of the last kind of national park systems to be brought on is Alaska and so there's several national parks in Alaska one of them is Glacier National Park which my family has visited and he's there in Glacier National Park and he penned these words I just want to read them to you because they're so poetic it says standing here with facts so fresh and telling and held up so vividly before us, every seeing observer must readily apprehend the earth sculpturing, landscape making action of flowing ice. And it's so beautiful. This ice is just flowing down off of the, the wall there. And here, too, one learns that the world, though made, is yet being made, that this is still the morning of creation. 
that mountains long conceived are now being born, channels traced for coming rivers, basins hollowed for lakes, that soil is being ground and outspread for coming plants, boulders and gravel for forest, finer soil for grasses and flowers, while the finest parts of the grist seen hastening out to sea and the draining streams is being stored away in darkness and built particle on particle, cementing and crystallizing to make the mountains and the valleys and the plains of other predestined landscapes to be followed by still others in endless rhythm and beauty that's why i love nature it's where we can most clearly see god's rhythm and beauty now if you've ever watched a soap opera you know that nothing happens like i said but then there'll be this one episode this monster episode is boom and there's this huge twist or there's this huge kind of resolution or this huge revelation And that happens pretty quickly in the Bible. So we get to season two of God's story, and it's the fall. We don't know how long the original man and woman were in the Garden of Eden, there in paradise, enjoying God's presence. But in an instant, everything changed. Humanity falls. We turn on God. We turn on each other. In a world where the only drama that was unfolding was God's creation, now had a new and much darker drama. It's kind of like when you take a show from network TV and then you re-ramp it on Netflix. It's much darker. It's what season two was like in God's story. We get to season three, and it's the story of Israel, and it's the Old Testament. It is a true soap opera. It's Jacob and Esau, and it's Lot and his daughters, and it's drunk Noah, and it's all these fallen heroes. And as you read that story in the Old Testament, it just seems to drag along. It's all this grumbling and complaining And then there's calls to repentance, and then you wash and repeat, and they do it all over again. Yet, woven without this drama, we can still see the unhurried rhythm of God. Abraham, if you remember Abraham, he's 75 years old. That's a long time in the first place, and he's promised a child. That child still doesn't come for 25 years. It's the unforced rhythm of God. The Hebrew people, they're promised freedom, yet they remain enslaved for 400 years And once they're released, they wander around the wilderness for 40 more years before God brings them into the promised land. It's the unforced rhythm of God. Throughout the Old Testament, the centuries passed, but there's no redemption. There's no promised Messiah. God is slow, and the people get tired of this slow God. And so they try to make new gods that will move faster. And a few, though, in the story, when we read it, are in tune with God's pace. And those are the songwriters in Psalm. In Psalm 103, David writes, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Then we get to the end of that story in the Old Testament, and the story just seems to end. It's like the the producers have pulled the plug, the saga has been canceled. Then out of nowhere... A new season is announced. And man, I just like that. I can imagine the trailer that would have played if TV was around again and it had been this voice and it would have came on and it said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through Him, all things were made, and that Word became flesh, and now that flesh dwells among us. And that would be the launch of season four, the redemption story, the long-awaited hero that had been promised for thousands of years, that everything had been building towards since the beginning of time, now has finally, in God's timing and his slow timing, has came and he's overcome. But then the final season is announced, season five. And God's pace, though, still doesn't speed up because that season five has been running for the last 2,000 years. And now you and I are a part of that story. We're here improvising our lines as God patiently uses us in his unforced rhythm of grace. I love traveling. A lot of vacations this summer. But one of the things I hate most about traveling, other than airplanes probably, are tourists. Of course, the irony is not wasted on me that I am a tourist when I'm on vacation. But tourists, and when they're on vacation, it's pretty much they want to see as much as they can, as fast as they can. And so they'll go to the Grand Canyon. I think there's a movie or something where a guy does this. He goes to the Grand Canyon, sees the big hole, like, oh, great, big hole, fantastic, takes a picture, goes to the sign, takes a picture, gets a stamp in his book, and he's like, what's next? See, tourists, when they're on vacation, they're afraid they're going to miss something. All the while, they miss the fact that they're missing something as they chase after something else. One of the things I love to do when I'm on vacation, especially if it's in another country and it's a new culture, is I just like to go to a cafe or a coffee shop 
and just sit there hour upon hour and watch the people because that's where you get a feel for the culture. You get to feel like you live there, just that slow pace. Or recently, we were in Biscayne National Park, and instead of just snorkeling all over the reef and wanting to see as much of it as we possibly could, we finally learned that if you would just lay in one place and float over top of one spot on that reef, all these fish and all these things would start to appear, and you saw a lot more beauty slowing down instead of chasing after that next thing. It's easy for us to become tourists in our own lives trying to just go as fast as we can to get to that next big thing. There are also a lot of tourists in the church. You show up, you're like, cool, good Saturday night, I saw it, got the t-shirt, but you don't linger around, you don't stay in the church. There's no long investment over a long arch period of time. Church is just a pit stop every few Saturday nights when you make it here. And then you run right back out into the rat race to see what you can chase. And the problem is church leaders have learned this about church people. And so we've tried to speed up church. We've essentially become tourist traps, trying to dispense as many cheap religious goods and services as we can in the shortest amount of time possible. Last week I mentioned we talked about being a purposely small church. And we're going to not focus on numerical results. And that's in part because when you focus on the numbers, that can make you a slave to speed, trying to find the most efficient and fastest way to grow. And what often happens then is a lot more like when Walmart moves into a small town. It doesn't create many new shoppers. It just siphons away shoppers from other stores that can't compete with the selection and price. The problem is there's always a bigger Walmart on the horizon, Amazon doing that now, and then that cycle repeats, bigger and better. Most of history was a slow pace. Life was tied to seasons. In Florida, you couldn't eat a mango in the wintertime. Those were a summertime fruit, about the beginning of June through the middle of July. That's when you ate mangoes, but now you can eat them year-round. Not very good, but you can eat a mango year-round. Once upon a time, believe it or not, not long ago, you had to make your own clothes. To make clothes was a slow process. You had to raise the sheep. You had to grow some cotton if that was the case. Then you had to find a way to harvest whatever it was. And then you had to spin it into threads. And then you had to make cloth. And then you had to sew some clothes. I'm sure there's a hundred other steps, but it was a very slow process. Today, I'm ticked if Amazon takes two days to get me the thing I already forgot that I ordered. We expect everything to be fast with no inconveniences. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you know who that is, this is in the 1940s. He was a Lutheran pastor. He's in Germany, very anti-Nazi. He stood up for the Jews, originally was arrested as a Christian, even spent time in concentration camps, and then was eventually hanged for his so-called crimes. He's a beautiful writer, though, and I just want to listen to what he wrote here. He says, waiting is an art that our impatient age has forgotten. Remember, this is written in the 1940s. It wants to break open the ripe fruit when it has hardly finished planting the shoot. But all too often, the greedy eyes are only deceived. The fruit that seems so precious is still green on the inside. Whoever does not know the blessedness of waiting will never experience the full blessing of fulfillment. Those who don't know how it feels to struggle anxiously with the deepest question of life and patiently look forward with anticipation until the truth is revealed cannot even dream of the splendor of the moment in which clarity is illuminated. And for those who do not want to win the friendship and love of another person, who do not even open up their soul to the soul of the other person, for such people the deepest blessing of two intertwined souls will remain forever hidden. For the greatest, most pr profound, tenderest things in the world, we must wait. It happens not here in a storm, but according to the divine laws of sprouting, growing, and becoming. One of the blessings of this pandemic has been it has forced most of us to slow down. And I think some of us, me included, have discovered we like the slower pace. But there is a tendency, and I can already feel it, to speed back up. Kids are now going to school this week, and we're starting routines. And I know before long, my calendar will be full, and I'll be too busy to just pause and question how I ended up back being busy and moving fast again in the first place. Have I ever seen the movie Supersize Me by uh, Morgan Spurlock? 
It's a pretty good show. Uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years, 12 years ago, documentary on the destructive nature of fast food. And of course, he really picks on McDonald's in that documentary. We all pick on McDonald's, but we all also love McDonald's. There's one pretty much everywhere. Again, we're in Biscayne National Park. We're getting ready to do that snorkeling thing. We forgot to, we didn't forget to eat. We went to a restaurant. I had a breakdown and we left the restaurant. Somehow we get to this place and we hadn't eaten. It's like one in the afternoon. We're all starving. The lady says, well, you know, there is a McDonald's back in town and this is out in the middle of nowhere. And we're like, praise the Lord, there's a McDonald's. We all went there and ordered some salt with a side of salt and a cup of sugar to drink. And we enjoyed our McDonald's. Fast food is convenient. It's predictable. It's efficient. But when we consume too much fast food, it's incredibly damaging. We can become sick and lethargic. And then we develop a taste, though, for nothing else other than fast food. And we stop craving the things that are actually good for us. Psalm 34, 8, though, says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. My youngest daughter, who was in here for worship, she's eight years old. She loves sushi. The problem is, though, we'll go out to a restaurant and get sushi, and her plate will come out. We'll look away for three seconds and look back, and she has scarfed down the entire plate of sushi, and it was supposed to be shared. And we keep telling her, girl, you gotta, you got to slow down. You need to taste the food. You need to enjoy it. And we actually encourage her, when you eat it, think about the flavors. This is just a way to get her to slow down. Think about the flavors that you are tasting in this, as she says, sushi. But enjoy those flavors. We need to slow down and savor our time with God. We need to slow down and taste and see his goodness. I don't know if this is like a question on an SAT test or kind of how they do it, but if you have a question like this, is A, if the church is the body of Christ, and B, we're supposed to taste and see the Lord, then the answer would be C, then the church is how the saved save your Christ, and the lost get their first taste of his goodness. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is preaching in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, I mentioned fast food. It uses a lot of salt. They cover up the food to the point where pretty much all you taste is salt. And fortunately, I guess for them, most of us have learned to crave salt. But salt is meant to enhance flavor, not be the main course of a meal. Some of us in the church, though, have been eating nothing but church salt diet for so long that we've forgotten what God himself actually tastes like. And all we're tasting is the salt from the church. And so as a church, we want to enhance the flavor of God, not cover up his flavor. We want to bring out the depth of his flavor, not just the depth of our church's flavor, so that we and so that everybody that walks through these doors can taste and see the vast palette of God. I like that new song that we sang tonight. It's just so slow and simple, but the words, I can't get enough, I can't walk away, for I have seen your face, I have tasted you, God. There's nothing else like it. It's what it's like when you taste the Lord, when you truly taste his flavor. You realize there's nothing else like it, and you won't want anything else. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was in Matthew 22, you probably know this. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think there's a saying, you can't hurry love, right? So who, sang, who sings that? It's like Diana Ross or Phil Collins, maybe both of them. You can't hurry love. Jesus says that's the greatest commandment, but we know that you can't hurry loving someone. You can't hurry compassion. You can't hurry commitment. You can't hurry empathy. You can't hurry patience. All of those things, love, compassion, empathy, all of those things take time because they're sacrificial. They have a long growing season. The Bible also says in the story that God is of a slow pace. I hope I laid out that theology that God moves slowly. And then we are made in the image of God, which means that we too are designed to move at a slow pace. And I don't mean just crawling around, moving slowly through life, never having any urgency. I don't want any of you kids to, you know, be slow getting your shoes on or anything and trying to use that on your, per- your parents. But I'm talking about we need to be slow 
in how we process our thoughts. We need to be slow and practice mindfulness and be present in the moment that we're in. We need to be slow and focus on the face that's in front of us in that moment instead of thinking about the hundred other things that we would rather be doing instead of spending time with that person. Mother Teresa spoke to this. She's referencing Matthew 25, 40, which is one of my favorite verses. It's Jesus talking about serving the least of these, and when we serve the least of these, we're serving him. And she said, I see Jesus in every human being. And so I say to myself, this is hungry Jesus. I must feed him. This is sick Jesus. This is leprosy Jesus. I must wash him and tend to him. I serve because I love Jesus. If Jesus were here today, tonight, Or better yet, if Jesus was there at your workplace or there at your school and you had a chance to serve him, would you rush through it as fast as you could? Or would you slow down and take all the time needed to do it right? Would you try to speed it up so you could clean up all the messy, inconvenient parts of the process that you just didn't feel like doing? Or would you enjoy every moment you got to spend in the presence of your Lord? I got a text yesterday from one of you here tonight, and uh, the text just asked me to pay for, pray for a friend because he had been up that night from 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. answering this friend who was a non-believer's questions about God. And he got that opportunity because of 10 years of friendship that led up to that moment. That's slow church. This week, our family got a card from another person in the room, and it's somebody we've known for 10 plus years, and she just recounted all the ways that our family, it was so nice, our family had been a blessing to her and her family. It was a long period of time. That's slow church. Slow church happens not here in an hour on Saturday. It happens out there where we live, where we work, where we go to school, where we eat, where we play, anywhere we've planted our roots. Up in Indiana, Karen's dad has a weeping willow or a couple weeping willow trees in their yard. I guess that's a northern thing. I don't think we have them down here. They're a pretty great tree because you can plant one small. They grow super fast. I think it's one of the top five fastest growing trees that are out there. I don't think we have them down here, though, because the darn things would never make it through a hurricane season. They had some 30-mile-per-hour winds, and it blew both trees that size, just blew them straight over because they, don't, they grow fast. But they don't develop deep roots, which means there is nothing that holds them in the soil. Colossians chapter 2, Paul says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Then he says, Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong and you will overflow with thankfulness. Overflow with thankful. To overflow means that you are so full from tasting and seeing God that you can't help but overflow with thankfulness or love or joy. It's a completely natural thing. There are a lot of things to love about living down here in South Florida. We got great beaches. Our weather is awesome in the wintertime. There's no state income tax. I mean, that, that truly is a great thing. A lot of reasons to love Florida, but our lawns are not one of them. Florida lawns, they're awful. It's our soil is the reason our lawns are so bad. It's that sandy stuff that we have down here. It lacks nutrients. It doesn't drain very well. The bugs seem to just love the soil. And so to have a decent looking lawn, you got to dump all these chemicals on top of the lawn. And so we fertilize it so that it'll turn green. And we put herbicide on it so it keeps the weeds at bay. And we put fungicide on it to deal, I guess, with fungus. I don't know what else it would deal with. We put pesticide on it to deal with parasites. And we got these grasses. I don't even know if they're real grasses. They're made up in some lab somewhere. Floratam, zoysia, bahia. bahia. It's all like genetically modified grass to try to help it survive this rough and difficult Florida climate. But if you spend enough money and if you dump enough chemicals on top of that lawn... You can't end up with a beautiful and a fast-growing lawn. But it's kind of fake. It's not the natural way. Because the minute you stop dumping all those unnatural chemicals on top, the weeds come back, there's big brown dead patches all over, and the lawn begins to brown and die and wither in the Florida sun. We could grow church fast. It's a pretty simple formula, y'all. It's not hard. 
It's been franchised pretty well in America. You, you fertilize your church. You get modern stage design that's beautiful. You get a tightly scripted worship service without mistakes. You preach a relevant, heartwarming message about how to be a Christian in five easy steps. You just dump that fertilizer out there. And then you pour some herbicide on it. You just build a bunch of program after program to keep your church members at the church and away from the weeds of the world. And then you try to deal with the funguses among us. You scr- we scrub our sanctuaries clean. Everybody here is smiling. The pastor always stands up front, says how excited he is to be here. I don't know why pastors are always saying they're excited to be here, but they're always excited to be there. And we can obviously chase away the parasites and the pests, those people who are always coming in and they try to disrupt things, ask a bunch of pesky questions like, does God make people love him or do we have free will? And they actually want to talk about it. So we chase away all those pests so we don't have them in the church. McDonald's has the formula worked out for fast food. They franchised it. I think the American church has been moving towards an efficient fast food growth model because it's efficient, it's predictable, and it does work. But what is the long-term cost of that? How sustainable is that process? Where else could that money be put to work? What problems is created By the runoff. We know the runoff problems from fertilizers and pesticides. And what happens when all that fertilizing stops? We got a glimpse of that during COVID. That statistic that 30% of the people are now gone and not coming back because all the fertilizing and the herbiciding and the parasiting, all that has stopped for a period of time. It's a parable in Matthew, the parable of the sower, and I won't read the whole text to you because I think most of us know the story. We've shared it before here, but the farmer goes out and he plants some seeds and just scatters them out in the field. And some of those seeds, they fall on the footpath where the birds come in and they eat up the seeds. And some of the seeds fall on shallow soil and they fall on rocks and they sprout up fast, but they wilt and die because they didn't have deep roots, kind of like the willow tree. And other seeds get choked out by weeds, probably need some herbicide. But still some fall on fertile soil, the Bible says, and they produce a crop of a hundred times or more. Often in the church, though, we view the soil, which is what helped those crops grow, we view the soil as just a convenient way to prop up the plant while we try to sustain the plant from the top down. And we use those methods, and and then they stop working. And so we add more complexity. We start using stronger fertilizer, faster-acting herbicides, It's the top-down approach. But the natural approach is to feed the plant from the bottom up, through the soil. But building good soil, I tell you, that's a slow process. Whether that's in your personal lives or whether that's us collectively at a church, you don't plant a seed in soil on Monday and have apples on Tuesday. It's a slow process. So as I thought about being slow, as a human being or as a church this week, I just started keeping a list on my little notes app of things that are fast and their slow counterparts just to get our head around this. And I encourage everybody to do this. Just put your notes app, put fast and put something, you'll see, and then put slow and put something, its counterparts. So I wrote, Facebook is fast, conversations are slow. Revenge is fast, reconciliation is slow. Divorce is relatively fast, marriage is slow. Gossip is fast. Seeking truth is slow. Charity is fast, but engaging with our neighbors needs to be slow. Divisiveness is fast. Civility is slow. Black and white thinking is fast. Nuance is slow. Religious platitudes are fast, but walking with someone through suffering is slow. Voting pro-life is fast. Adopting a child is slow. Protests are fast. Solving injustices is slow. Guilt is fast. Confession and repentance are slow. A 30-minute sermon is fast. Some of you might argue with that tonight. Uh, Growing as a disciple is slow. We live in a fast culture, the fastest in history. And I sound so much like a preacher when I say stuff like that, but it is the fastest culture in history, and it's only going to get faster for the coming generations. Which means, though, that the church is perfectly positioned to be countercultural what Jesus always calls us to be, to be upside down, to be backwards, to be counter of what the culture is. And so we are perfectly positioned to slow down, to build soil where folks can come in and the roots can grow deep. 
This week, I was thinking about the ministries we support as a church financially through your giving. The money you give to the church for all time and eternity goes through these ministries financially. And these are very slow ministries. I started thinking about a hoops on mission. You know, they, they're trying to work with and serve inner city kids living in poverty. I mean, that is a slow process. He's trying to bring cultures together. That is a slow, difficult process. Into the Jordan, cess- traffic victims. Those are deep scars. That's a slow, lifelong healing process. Our recovery ministries. They have meeting after meeting, mentor after mentor, day by day in their sobriety. Slow process. Compassionate friends. It's our bereavement group. I mean, can you imagine saying to them, hurry up and get over your pain? It's a slow process of healing. This week, one of our members, Dominic Leodi, texted me. He said, I got a tangerine tree for you. He knows I like plants. I said, great. He said, I don't want to you know, come in contact. We're trying to be safe, but I'll drop it on your front porch. And so he dropped this tangerine tree on our front porch. And then I, I didn't get around to planting it that day. And he texted me, though, to be sure I knew how to care for its roots when I planted this, this little bitty tangerine tree. He said, you need to tease the roots out. They were kind of like this. You need to tease them out to be really gentle, to take care of those roots. You need to put some mud down in the hole and make it wet so that when you stick those teased out roots in, they have that soft place to land and then you put the dirt around. Because every time you transplant a plant, it does damage to its roots. And so as a church, we need to be very gentle as we help each other transplant from that fast world out there and take root in a slow God. We certainly don't need to dump a bunch of salt and fertilizer on them. You know how that goes? Here's how that goes. Somebody comes in, and you're like, hey, what brings you here? Well, like, well, I came because well, the name on the door says refuge. And life has been hard. I feel like I'm running on empty. I'm on this never-ending treadmill. I'm exhausted. I just thought I needed a refuge. And then we say to them, all right, great. You, you came to the right place. We're here every single Saturday night. There's teaching, there's worship. You come back every single week and you probably should listen to all of our podcasts because it brings you up to speed on where Brian's teaching in that week. And have you heard of a small group? You're new to church, so you might want to join two of them, really develop some relationships. And we have a Bible study on Thursday. It's about fast track to success. I think that'd be great for you. You play the piano, you need to join the worship team. They come in at 3 p.m. You need to practice the songs at, at, uh, throughout the week. And how old is little Johnny there? Oh, he's 13. You need to sign him up for youth group. They meet twice a week, two hours each time. And have you heard of a leadership conference? Because those are great. And did you see we got a service event coming up? And By the way, don't forget, you need to start talking to people about Jesus at work. And you need to be sure everybody now knows that you're on Team Jesus. And you're going to start wanting to have people over to your house. And you're going to need to cook for them. And you're going to need to clean for them because Jesus did meals. And and be sure you show perfect hospitality. Have we helped them slow down and take root? And we've just sped up their lives even more. There are a million good ideas out there. But if we try to do them all as a church and we try to move faster and faster, we're just going to become more and more efficient, which might sound good, but we become more and more like the culture of the world and less and less like the culture of Jesus. And so I'll close with this. I don't know if you've ever been to an amusement park or county fair. Those things are scary as heck, all the rides there. There's a holiday world up where we're from in Indiana. They have those rides, and I don't know what you call that thing. I googled it this week. Somebody says it's a Gravitron. I call it the spinning circle of puke, but you know the the ride that I'm talking about. I mean, everybody knows, because you probably once in your life you were an idiot, and you got on that stupid thing, and maybe some of you enjoy it. I don't know. But you get on that ride, you know, and you're kind of back here against the wall, and you can move your hands out, and you're, you're pretty free. You can reach out to the center, no problem. But as that ride starts to spin, and it starts to go faster and faster, the faster that thing spins, the more you get pinned back away from the center of that ride. The center of our culture of refuge is what we talked about that very first week, the core of the peach. It's the gospel of grace, that we are all misfits who are saved by that grace. And the faster we spin as a church, the further I fear that we will move away from that core. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace.
The rhythm of grace. The rhythm of grace. It's a slow, steady beat. That's why in a fast world, we are attempting to be a slow church. Slow because love and grace and compassion and mercy and justice, all of those things can't happen fast. Take time to grow. We're slow because we truly want to taste the complexity of God, not just church salt. Psalm 46, 1. I told you these guys sometimes get it, these songwriters. It says, God is our refuge and strength. It's kind of where our name came from, Psalm 46, 1. Psalm 46, 10, later on, just 10 verses later, the writer says, and be still, this is speaking as God, be still and know that I am God. It's hard to be still when you're moving too fast. Truly believe that God is going to do in whatever time he decides, in whatever way he decides, he's going to do amazing things with the salt of refuge, with the soil that refuge develops. So let's be still, know that he's God, slow down, try not to miss it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time here together this evening. God, we thank you for just this one hour that we do have each week as a way to slow down, to pause in the hectic and craziness of life. But God, don't let our church life and, and our faith life and our life as disciples be only about this one hour. Let us slow down, and not add a bunch of church stuff and programs on top of our lives so that we speed up even more and feel busier and more stressed out. But God, just, just help us to be mindful, to slow down, to focus on savoring you, your beauty, whether that's through song, whether that's through nature. Focus on serving you wherever we meet people and we serve them slowly and purposely. God, we thank you for that core, that gospel of grace and that mercy that saves misfits and sinners like each of us in this room. We thank you for the slowness and your patience with each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. So a couple of announcements before I send you on your merry way this evening. Teachers in the room. I see a couple of teachers here. I know there are teachers listening out there. And even if you're not a teacher here as part of our church, if you guys need anything, we truly say this every year. If you need anything for your classrooms, for your lives, let us know. I mean, we can't get you a Porsche or anything like that, but we can, we can get you some stuff for your classroom. If you need an air purifier because you need that in your classroom to protect from those germs, let us know. We want to help provide for your classrooms. There's so many backpack drives, and we did that as a church this year yet again. And thank Christine for that and getting those backpacks over to the kids in Pine Manor. We've done that for, for a decade now, I think, between several of us here at the church. And that's all great. I'm very thankful for that. But I know sometimes the teachers get forgotten about in that process. And so we just want you teachers to know. If you need anything, let us know. We want to provide for your classroom. And for everybody who's struggling out there financially or with whatever in life, let us know. We want to pray for you. We want to provide for you. Uh, if you do need financial assistance, you can go to refuge.church slash virus, and there's a way to request that, and we would be happy to help shore you up in the short term financially. Thanks for being here. Slow down this week, all right? God bless. Stay safe. See you next week.